I look back on like what got me into HR and again, talking about being a minority in the States, especially in West Virginia, where like maybe four or five percent of the population's black and um, they make you aware of it from time to time, is that I, I knew the solution to my problem was outside of me outside of my race, outside of my gender, probably, you know, I needed other people to be successful. So it's like a, a um, survival uh, tactic is to sort of bridge, you know, build a bridge with people who aren't like me. It's, it's, I think unconsciously it's survival. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a mode of survival. It's Wednesday morning once again. It's Japan Expert Insights, uh, our business insights room. And today we have uh, the pleasure of welcoming Henry Seals, the co-founder of uh, Tokyo Black Professionals. And I'm mentioning this because I discovered Henry through this organization, through this uh, project, actually. And I was blown away by the efficacy and uh, the great uh, insights um, people who attend uh, the events can gain from being there, listening to the members and the guest speakers there as well. And uh, when I was there, of course, I talked with Henry just a little bit too. And um, his passion for helping people was something that something that got me. And uh, I believe that uh, people like Henry, we need more people like you, Henry, actually, in uh, this <laughs> time and day. And uh, I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you very much for uh, agreeing to be our guest speaker today and welcome. So um, we talked a little bit in advance, and I would like you to please tell us a little bit about yourself first. Sure. Uh, Let me start at the beginning. I am born in the United States. I'm from West Virginia. I don't know how many people have actually been there, but I was raised in West Virginia. Uh, My mother and father, of course, from West Virginia, and I graduated um, from high school, actually Virginia, in in, in 92. From there, I went to Harvard. primarily because it was like a childhood dream. It was one of those things I thought, being a country boy as I was, I thought that um, the only way to get out of the country or to see the world was to, you know, sort of go to the big city and go to you know, these colleges and go to Ivy League College and see the world. Very, very basic view of the world, probably based on Hollywood movies and stuff like that. But also, um, I just want to explain that uh, because I think it's, re- re- it's, rel- it's relative to Black Professionals Tokyo is when I was about nine years old or so, this uh, movie with C. Thomas Howell called Soul Man um, came out. And it was a movie about a, a, a white kid who... Uh, uh, can't get into Harvard Law School and decides to take um, decides to um, pose as a black black kid to get into the school. And I I just saw the movie it was on HBO. You know, you're sitting there watching it. it. Had James Earl Jones in it, so you know his voice. You know, Darth Vader. I mean, you can't go wrong listening to his voice. And in the movie, you know, he it's a very typical '80s movie. He experiences racism and these challenges or whatnot. And his teacher at the end, the one who's James Earl Jones, sort of, you know, tells him, you know, as a black student, you've got to work harder and you've got to be careful and all these kind of things. And eventually he comes out as saying, you know, he's, um, you know, he goes through these situations where as a black student, and I remember the first time I, I, I played basketball, Harvard Law School has a, a gym behind uh, Harvard Yard. And I remember um, there's a scene where he's in the gym and because he's the black um, he's black. They, all the uh, guys want to choose him for their base for basketball team. <laughs> it was a funny scene, you know, something I'd, I'd experienced growing up. And so I, I saw this movie and I saw those challenges and I saw at the end of the movie, you know, he learned a lesson, that type of thing, very basic stuff. But what it taught me as a, as a nine-year-old or 10-year-old was, wow, you know, um, that kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm a, I'm a masochist or something, but I said, oh, that kind of challenge seemed to make him a better person. It gave him a perspective. And that really had a strong impression on me. And I think after that movie, I told my father I wanted to go to Harvard. So that's where it came from. It came from this idea that, you know, my difference is something that I think will give me a unique experience that allow me to add value to the people around me, whether they're black or white or whatever. So that's just part of, I think, my makeup as a person. Anyway, that's related to as I move forward about 20 years. So I'm a college, I study Japanese because I think, wow, I've never met a Japanese person. I can study Japanese now because it wasn't available to me when I was growing up. Wind up in Japan, live with a host family. And um, I was the first, um, not the first host student they had, but I was the first black student they had. And it was it was, I say that because they brought it up um, in the context of about three months into my homestay, my um, host father, he, they spoke no English. And he, he sat me down and tried very hard to explain to me that he didn't, he didn't originally want me in his home. And I said, really? And it, it, I started to realize, oh, that's why I didn't have a host family until maybe a week before I came to Japan. You know, the, the center would tell me, sorry, you don't have a host family yet. And I would think, OK, I wonder why not. Now I realized why um, none of the parents I was told that no other parents or families wanted me. 
And uh, my host father didn't either because he had heard back in the 70s uh, when he was on a business trip to the United States. And this is his words, not mine. He goes, I was told that blacks were only good for jazz and crime. And he goes, but, you know, I, I my, my, hit my host mother and my host sister uh, told him that he was wrong. They didn't actually, that wasn't his words. His words were, they said I was an idiot and, um, that I was going to stay in their home. Now I would never have known he felt that way towards me, but, um, he, he just admitted that, that he had these issues and he's concerned with me. But now that I'm his son, he loves me. Now an older Japanese man saying he loves you is unique. We all know this Japan, they don't really communicate that, but I, I got the experience that I was their first experience with, with, with someone of color. I, um, they could learn to love me. And I said, if they had never met me or had the opportunity to meet me, you know, my life would be less because of it. And probably theirs, but I think I'm kind of cool. So, um, <laughs> jokes aside though, these are the kind of things that made me realize that, okay. Um, you know, being of African American, African American, there's certain stereotypes people have about you, whether it's here in Japan or America. Um, there's not really a place for us to sort of commiserate about the silliness that we have to go through sometimes. Um, there's not a place, um, and, you might not hear this very often, but going through that can make you bitter and you need someone to speak to to sort of get rid of the bitterness, you know, to try to uplift you because you can start seeing the world as a world full of enemies, that kind of thing. And on top of that, there's not a place people can come to and say, I've never met anyone of color or really had friendships with a diverse group of, of people. I want to meet these people. And I said, I'll, I'll create an organization that, that, that does that because, um, the reality is that if someone else does it, and I know because I felt this from time to time, you want to create a group that's insular to protect you from frustration, to protect you from pain, to protect you from what you consider to be, you know, things you shouldn't have to deal with. Right. Um, and I said, no, I think the solution to one's problems, as I've learned in life, is, you know, really building bridges with people, you know, feeling love with people who you would never have met before, again, got to know and et cetera. So uh, I felt I met some like minded people and we created Black Professionals Tokyo. Um, and of course, I know the irony of that is if I had set a group called White Professionals Tokyo, there might have been some issue with that, but there's a context to it. And I also thought that I was capable. And those of us who started were capable of explaining that to people when they would say, like someone who wasn't for yourself, Maya, you know, we never had this conversation, but there are several people I've invited who are like, well, that's a black group or it's black professionals. I don't feel welcome there. And I said, I'm sorry, you know, a name's a name, but you can trust me. It's OK. And over the years, you know, people come, they realize this is a place for you to do it. As my wife and I joke, uh, we say to experience the blackness, <laughs> you know, all of us, you know, to sort of, you know, um, you know, um, sharing with each other and sharing with others, um, you know. Uh, our, not just our experience about racism, but just experience, you know, experience us, you know, you find people who may be, uh, you know, you can work with or people you may want to have on your podcast or people you may want to, to marry. I met my wife, uh, Sasha at a black professionals, um, event, um, that sort of corresponded with, coincided with Obama's inauguration in 2009. So, you know, people meet, and, um, you know, uh, do business or marry each other, or just have nice conversations. So that's sort of the journey with regard to, as it relates to, you know, why someone like me or why I created Black Professionals Tokyo and the sort of the mental gymnastics, mental experiences and emotional experiences behind that, um, behind that um, uh, sort of decision. I'll explain what Black Professionals Tokyo is if, if, if you wish to ask Maya, but I thought I'll pause here in case you have another question because I could go on forever. Yes, and I can listen to you forever. Uh, well, I, uh, I like uh, how you, you mentioned that, uh, well, the, you mentioned the inclusivity of uh, Tokyo Black Professionals. And mm -hmm. I because just as you mentioned earlier, when I was invited by uh, a friend of uh, mine, who is mm -hmm. uh, actually, she's um, a regular, regular uh, attendant there, mm -hmm. and she invited me to, to one of your events. And I was like, well, I'm not black, so maybe that's not a place I can go to. And right. that was my first reaction. And uh, right. when I went there, I... The, uh, there was nothing like, uh, you know, I didn't feel excluded at all. It was wonderful mm -hmm. to be there. Uh, there was all that sense of uh, um, inclus inclusivity. And, uh, but that's, that's the first thing that actually got me when I was mm -hmm. there. And the second thing was, uh, once again, I mentioned in the beginning, but uh, the insights I could get and I could learn how much I could learn mm -hmm. actually by being there and listening to, to your guest speaker first and then talking mm -hmm. with uh, uh, the other people who are attending. And uh, yeah, that was uh, wonderful. Um, just, I don't know how to say it, to put it in a different way, but uh, yeah. I think I see I, what you're getting at, sir. I think I see what you're getting at, but please continue. Sorry. 
No, I wanted also to say that uh, I was happy. First, actually, I was um, very much into inviting Sasha to be our guest speaker. And Mm -hmm. (laughs) so, uh, in a sense, I felt a little bit that I didn't match her energy because <laughs> neither do i sometimes <laughs> yes but uh, she's definitely on uh, you know on my list of invitees and uh, yeah I, I very much hope to help to have her here and have her tell us about her projects because i know that uh, there are projects there too but yes please mm-hmm. continue no worries. Um, I think uh, you raised a, a point that I was actually, it's related to what I was going to say about the sort of the insight, sort of the topics and themes of, of the various um, First Fridays. Now, you know, not all of them have always had a topic. Sometimes when we first started, it was just an opportunity for people to, to, to mix and, and get to know each other. A lot of people coming in and out of Tokyo or in and out of Japan. But uh, one of the reasons we do these type of topics is coming from um, West Virginia, I remember uh, growing up, I used to go to a comic book store. Sorry, this is another story, but I, it's related. I go to a comic book store. And what I found uh, working at the store, I worked behind the register, you know, comic books for people and lots of men and women from different backgrounds would come in and they would share stories about, you know, them growing up and stories about comic books, stories about movies. And I came to realize that, you know, not every, not, there wasn't one single person who knew everything, though there were people who definitely felt they knew everything, but uh, I was I'm observing this. And I worked in this shop for about seven or eight years growing up. And you would see that in order for there to be a real conversation or real sort of growth or learning, you needed several different people. It was like um, to, to really make one, you know, it's kind of like watching as a kid, I would, I would say it's like watching the Super Friends cartoon. You can't just have Superman. You need Wonder Woman and Batman and everyone else to sort of create a, a, a cohesive team that can cover all the bases. And so I grew up um, several of my 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 um, kids I grew up with actually one I worked in the in the comic book store with and these are these are white kids they're not they're not black um, didn't graduate from junior high school even they didn't they you know they read books but they didn't really you know like school <clears throat> they're fine now they're all grown up adults but they didn't like school and I was someone who liked school I liked reading I liked books um, I liked traveling I was very extroverted and they were not so I thought it was my goal, right? As far as our, in our relationship as friends was to go out there, have exciting adventures and come back and tell them about it or take them along with me, that type of thing. So, you know, um, I, as I, you know, when black professionals, or we call it first Fridays, when black professionals started, there were people from all over the place who didn't have exposure either to Japan and the language. Maybe they, maybe they, um, their experience was in tech or entertainment or various different things. And there's a, there's something missing, meaning they were looking for something to sort of help them complete the puzzle of their, whatever their success plan was in Japan. And I said, okay, let me listen to these people. And over a couple of years, you sort of figure out, okay, you know, um, people, when they come to Japan, they need to know this. Um, I mean, from the small to the big, first of all, of course, when you're black, your hair is a little different from, from, from Japanese or even Westerners hair. So you need to find a, you know, a barber, you know, or just, or, or, or a beautician, for instance, or, you know, you need to find a place to learn the language, or you need to understand how to, 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 to manage your visa, or you need to understand how to interview in a Japanese context to create a resume or, you know, you, various other things. And you're listening to people or people want to learn about relationships or they want to learn about managing their emotions or therapy a myriad of things and you start hearing these stories you start putting finding patterns you say okay next month we'll have this topic next month we'll have this topic and we try to do it democratically meaning either we'll do i think last month we did a uh, survey on facebook but before facebook surveys we would just you know um uh table suggestions and requests and you know sometimes it's a hit sometimes you know people um wanted to hear something and, you know, you plan it for the next month and they all come and they hear something and they're inspired and they're thankful. And then sometimes, you know, people's schedules being the way they are, you have a guest speaker and no one comes. I remember once we did a, a session on, um, uh, financial, um, freedom, basically I had several investment advisors come in and, and give talk to give a talk and we had food and desserts. My wife loves to bake. So she had baked some, um, blueberry, cobblers i think for for people guests who came but because the location was difficult to find no one came <laughs> you know that that happened so it's it hasn't been a completely a success every month but you know that that you know it, these seminars and talks come from a from a from a place of you know we're all missing something and um uh you know, let's let me let me try to provide that kind of value and maybe if i provide that kind of value people will keep coming and fortunately they've kept coming so that's that's great Yes, I can relate to that actually because that's the idea uh, which I came up with um, in what that was in the beginning of the pandemic. So I launched Japan Expert Insights, but of course uh, the people we 
were thinking about back then was were a different bunch of people. Still, um, I can relate to that, and uh, it really makes me um, feel that there is something when whenever you want to help people and think that you can do that and provide that value as you said people keep coming and uh, i'm happy that you have found also that uh, that niche actually you, you found it much much earlier than i did i believe because to me <laughs> quite later you know in my um professional and uh, professional career and life in japan mm-hmm. anyway yes you, you said something earlier that I wanted to also extrapolate on, and that was the the um, yep. inclusiveness of the group. Yes, the inclusiveness of the group. Mm, yeah. So um, another story. Forgive <laughs> me again. Here we go. Um, first week in college, um, there was a uh, meeting of the Black Student Association. And, you know, Black Student, you go, you go to see what it's about, basically an information session. And there were about 100 of us in the room. 20 men, 80 women, um, freshman class, freshman, you know, freshman class. And as I'm sitting in the room and the president at the time, I remember his name was Alvin. He's sharing with us, you know, the challenges at Harvard, for instance, you know, at Harvard, you had, um, what was the, what was the, um, I can't remember the professor's name, but books were written there, sort of like the bell curve, for instance, you know, books that sort of justified racism and, 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 and then sort of differences in education and, and differences in um, intellect due to color or whatnot. You know, these kind of books are being published at the college or whatnot. And as a college student, you sort of, um, you know, we we were told, as a new college student, we were told, you know, there's going to be a lot of challenges here, you know, a lot of racism, you know, prepare yourself. And I went into the room feeling afraid. I was afraid. Um, I, I, Unconsciously, I would say, but I'm aware of it now. I started to say, okay, everyone I meet is a potential is a potential enemy, which is true in life, regardless of your color. But I, I thought to myself, you know, that's not um, that's not how I saw the world. You know, I grew up with people who were different. I didn't even know that. You know, um, like I met, like we had my father. We had friends who were, you know, black, white. Jewish, Indian, whatever. I mean, I just hadn't met anyone from like uh, Southeast Asia, like uh, East Asia, like Chinese or Japanese growing up. But, you know, these were friends of my parents, people that we knew uh, in the neighborhood or people that are family friends. And so I, 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 in my brain, I kept saying, not everyone's an enemy. You know, I'd had the evidence, had the proof, so to speak. And so occasionally, though, um, that feeling of fear and being in a group where you feel like, you know, we're protected from the weirdos on the outside can make you make you racist listen let me not lie it can make you um uh bitter make you biased and all that kind of make you bigoted that's the word i was looking for make you bigoted and so but a lot of times that's produced by the leadership you have an organization that breeds that you know i don't even think it's intentional sometimes so it's really important that the leadership in an organization is able to not well to not practice that and not entertain it you know i've never and in these situations, you know, everyone's of the same color and we're, we're, we're we could, you know, because we're not in mixed companies, say racist things. You know, we could if we wanted to. Um, but I've, I've in fifth, how many years, 2007, 15 years or so of doing this organization, we've never had that. Um, you know, we have. And it also the irony of it all is that you'll pay people who look black, who are, you know, they're. Their father was Jewish, or their mother was white, or there's a there's a young there's a fellow, not young fellow. We were both young at the time. Um, I don't. I won't out him. I won't say his name. But if you meet him, he looks completely white. You would say, okay, he's white. And he came to Black Professionals once with his with his now wife, his girlfriend at the time. And you know, people kind of looking. He's kind of looking at the corner, like, what's that? And I'm like, um, I remember we were sitting at a place called Las Chicas. I don't know if you know Las Chicas. It's a restaurant that's no longer there. In Montesando. <clears throat> And I immediately, you know, because I had met him before, I knew him um, from LinkedIn, I think. Um, and I started having a conversation with him, treated him like he was, you know, we all sort of treated him like, you know, he's, he's a guest, he's here right? joining us, he's one of our group. And that sort of went away. And then later on, um, it might have been a couple of months later, he was like, you may not have known this, but my father was black. My father, my father is black. You know, he's never felt like he could belong in, 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 in he wanted to belong in the black community, so to speak, et cetera. And he was very thankful that he felt welcomed. And so, but if I had uh, entertained that mm, bias, like, why is this person here? Or this is my safe space to be a bigot, or this is my safe space to waddle in my big, my, my, my bitterness or, or fear, even. It's not really fear, bitterness. I say fear. Um, we would, um, we would know him. Um, other people wouldn't come. And then you, 
you know, the people who come because they are black, you know, they, they change, they realize, oh, I don't need to be afraid, you know, Japanese aren't out to get me or, you know, the world isn't, the world can be bad, but it's not a bad place just because it's the world, that type of thing. Um, so I learned that growing up, you know, I was, I, I learned that through work as well. You know, I, Dale Carnegie used to be a Dale Carnegie trainer and you train all these different people and you realize we're all the same, whether we, we don't want to admit it in times of weakness or we're upset at someone or someone's a Democrat or Republican or left or right or, you know, Jimito or, or Cometo or whatever, you know, you, you find reasons to say, well, I'm different from that person. But, you know, we, we know, you know, when it, there's really not a lot of difference between us. And but it's up to p- people in the group, leaders in the group to make that difficult decision. And so we've, we've, we've had to do that a lot of times. Um, occasionally, you know, we've had one or two people who join us thinking this is a place where I can be, be fearful. I can, I can, I can, I can, I can be bitter. I can be upset that, you know, I've been treated a certain way most of my life. And really that's not going to make you happy. It's not going to lead you to any sort of success. You got to get out of that and you got to find friends and people who help you, who care about you and who'll support you in doing that. So, um, that's, that's sort of our mission. And I'm glad you, when you came that you didn't feel that way at all, because that's, that's the point. Um, and hopefully as the word gets out, we'll have more people from all over the world there because they want to meet people of color. They want to be allies to us. They want to, 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 to sort of experience us in the wild, so to speak. Um, a safe space and come to realize that you know we're we're all you know aiming for the same thing and we can find ways to collaborate and build our future you know what i'm saying so, yeah. That's it, yeah yes i i totally agree with you about um uh, you know the necessity for us to find uh, similar similarities and uh, points that we share values that we share and at the end of the day we always always have you know um we all want the same things more or less we want uh, to have a job we want our kids to be happy and to have jobs to uh, yes. for them to be healthy and um, if we get if we are able to get deeper uh, beyond those um, let's say artificially built differences uh, yeah. that are based on uh, let's say political beliefs or uh, religious uh, beliefs or um, even you know beliefs based on based on skin color then uh, we will be do much, much better as a society and as a community. And uh, Henry, I know that uh, you currently you work um, as a chief uh, human resource uh, officer, um, but I know yes. you haven't been in this field um, uh, all the time. So what actually made you change the fields of work? And yeah. how that happened to you? What, yeah, okay, what, well, yeah. what happened? Well, I'll, I, I was thinking, let me try to make it sound sexy because in hindsight I could create a narrative around it. But the reality is... Um, you know, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I grad, I, when in college, I studied East Asian studies. I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to, well, I knew what I wanted to do out of college. I wanted to work for like the UN or some organization where I could help people communicate, like use my language ability or just my, 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 my skill sets to just bridge those kind of things, you know, just help people communicate with one another. That was the thing, whether it was, you know, I thought of things like publishing a newspaper or, or, or publishing a magazine, just to share information with people. Very, and I think it's related to the story I said earlier, working in a comic book store, having friends who never left West Virginia or never left our city. I said, I'm going to go out, see things and bring them back. Very, um, that also comes from, I think, you know, history and in and, and books where the, where the young man goes out into the world, has an adventure tells a story type of thing like gordon pym you know stories like that um, uh, that edgar Allan Poe story that type of thing that appealed to me and so um you know i I, i'm graduating like i want to go to japan i'd been an exchange student i really wasn't sure what i could do in japan i applied to companies and i got a job doing it uh because i had studied a little bit of computers well as a hobby in college so I got a job doing IT. I enjoyed the people part of the job. I enjoyed meeting new people. I enjoyed learning about technology, but I didn't necessarily enjoy being an IT specialist as, as, as a profession. It just wasn't something I, I realized I wanted to do. So I was a system engineer. I said, this isn't me. I did application development at a different company. I said, this isn't me. But I, again, in each job, my job was to sort of help people. You know, I'd gather user requirements for people and then build a system for them or help them you know, solve a problem using technology, but always the best part of the job was meeting people, meeting the, the users of the system or meeting the clients and getting to know them as people. Uh, so, I, you know, I just kept going from job to job, just taking that. But I felt, I, how do I put this? I was doing, I was 
now IT manager or something. I'm working in like insurance companies and I'm not enjoying my career. I'm just not, I'm not, a, I'm not someone who wants to create the map of how many, you know, problems we had on systems and how do we fix them and how do we make an SLA? It just wasn't, this wasn't me. So I got the opportunity to apply for a job at ING in 2005 to do project management. And again, that appealed to me because I would be working with people, helping them solve problems. That's my thing. I like solving problems. So um, this is related to how I got into HR by accident, but I like solving problems. So I could speak my way into the job. You know, I had done projects because I'd done a lot of IT work. I get the job and I enjoy it. You know, I'm educating people on project management, governance, I'm managing projects, I'm managing teams. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it, but I'm not a project management specialist. I know I didn't want to do that, you know, but I, 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 I did it for a while. And then, um, I'm working at ING about three years into my working there. Uh, the financial crisis hit. And we had to lay off a third of the employees. Now, because the market was bad, meaning financial markets were bad, and we laid off, you know, there were no projects to do. I assumed I would be going. I assumed I would be fired as well. There's no money, therefore no projects. But they kept me. And I'm looking around at my colleagues. And this time I'm working, uh, I'm doing projects in the finance space primarily. And people are demotivated, you know, have lunch with them. They don't know what their futures are going to be. They don't really have a lot of motivation or or excitement about their career opportunities. The world's kind of bleak. We can remember bleakness before the COVID, uh, before COVID, there was bleakness long before COVID. So people felt pretty bleak. And we had a new CFO join us because we had several CFOs who were supposed to get us out of this economic slump or with a financial slump and they, they weren't good at it. So we had a new CFO come on board and I was getting exhausted of just doing jobs I didn't really care for. And I told my wife at the time that I was going to, um, I was going to quit. I said, I'm going to find what I want to do. I, you know, I was doing a little bit of Dale Carnegie training. I was, I would add, Taking a Dale Carnegie class, and I thought maybe I want to be a trainer, you know, helping people. That sounds interesting. But I was going to quit. But before I do that, let me propose a plan to the CFO about improving, right, the the work environment, improving productivity, you know. And I based it on I would, you know, I said there's various pillars to having an engaged organization, all that kind of stuff. I'll, I'll leave that for a different conversation. But at the crux of it, I would interview every employee, all 90 employees in the finance organization. And I would get information and I would consolidate it. You can see what I've been doing it my whole life, like listening to people, seeing patterns in what they say, collecting it and then creating a plan, right? That, that sort of addresses, you know, those problems. And what I found that was that people wanted to learn on one end and then there are people who had the skills to teach on the other end and they wanted to teach, but they didn't know people wanted to learn. So, you know, data is very powerful. I learned that a long time ago, but in practice, I, I used that skill and came up with a, an engagement plan to where employees were doing lunch and learns, um, you know, uh, some employees were teaching other employees English, others were teaching them Japanese, some were teaching them Chinese, some were teaching them awkward, uh, actuarial science. And then I got all of our actuaries to create a training program where we invited executives and staff from different teams throughout the entire company to do like a, uh, like you manage an insurance company for a day, right? It's like a competition or whatnot. We did these programs and um, our CEO at the time at ING or NN now uh, participated in the program. And he asked, you know, he had, it was like a three-day program. And he asked my boss, who, 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 who did this? Who did this program? My boss said it was Henry. He goes, well, I, you know, I would like for this type of engagement sort of, you know, training and, and things to be done uh, by HR. You know, I'd like to send him to HR to be an HR at the term. At the time, the term was business partner. I'd never heard it before. Be an HR business partner to help sort of build this kind of teamwork collaboration within the company. Right. And the, that was it. I I went kicking and screaming into HR back in 2009. I did not want to do it. I didn't think it was me. I didn't think it was exciting. Um, I didn't think it was challenging. I thought it would be a very hostile work environment because I'm not an HR person. At least that's what I thought at the time and sort of true. I moved in. I did that kind of thing. I was HR business partner. Um, I enjoyed parts of it, learning the HR Rules and regulations was very difficult because it's all in in Japanese. I'm fluent, but those terms, man, they were new to me Um, doing that. And I've been doing HR pretty much ever since, so from 2009. But um, uh, I was trying to look back on like what got me into HR. And again, talking about being a minority in the States, especially in West Virginia, where like maybe four or five percent of the population is black and um, they make you aware of it from time to time, is that I knew that the solution to my problems wasn't I get all five percent of all the black people together in a room and we we we, we everything's fixed. I, I knew the solution to my problem was outside of me, outside of my race, outside of my gender, probably. You know, I needed other people to be successful. So it's like a, a um, survival 
uh, tactic is to sort of bridge, you know, build a bridge with people who aren't like me. It's, it's, I think unconsciously it's survival. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a mode of survival. And so that's my diversity. That's my skill set. And I've been doing that in my career, um, though it was in various different fields, but I want to do that more in my job. And so being CHRO does allow me to do that. I create corporate cultures where people are, are, are collaborating with each other and there's higher engagement, but that's just my job. I can't do that hundred percent of the time. Sometimes HR is documents and, and, and legalese and dismissals and all of that exciting stuff. So, you know, uh, Tokyo Black Professionals is a way for me to, to sort of exercise that muscle, Maya. And uh, that's why I think I've, conti- I've consistently done it as long as I have. Yeah, that's great to hear. So I one takeaway from what uh, this uh, story now for me is that even if you cannot uh, find your passion or, or cannot satisfy it uh, 100% at work, you look for something that is out there for you and you go yeah. for it. Um, just uh, the way you... you you said, you know, you're exercising your muscle with the Tokyo Black Professionals. Mm-hmm. And I have seen this. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, until recently, actually, I moved only in uh, Japanese professional circles. And only after I started um, uh, Japan Expert Insights, I moved, you know, to a more international community here. And, mm-hmm. um, well, from my experience, it is that, uh, especially among the Japanese people here, uh, men find it difficult to find their passion out of work. And sometimes uh, when they're so busy there, when they, uh, you know, have uh, uh, some uh, problems um, uh, whose solutions do not uh, depend on them, they got into a slump and uh, really don't feel good. And I have noticed that uh, women in general, here in Japan especially from uh, that experience, uh, they are much better at at finding their passion out of work. But... um, have you noticed anything similar like this? And if there is uh, something like that, even uh, among, you know, n- the non-Japanese community, what are some ways of dealing with this? Wow. I wish I was a specialist in that. I can give you my opinion on that. First of all, I agree with you. I think that, um, you know, when I was first working in Japan, I was working very domestic, um, uh, traditional Japanese company. And the men, you know, we... Well, I mean, I was a kohai, you know, I was, I would follow my, my senpai and my kacho and them and drink with them and hang out with them. But it's very much, you know, their hobbies and their, and their, and their, um, their interests were linked to their colleagues. They go golfing together. They drink together. Um, sometimes they'd have, you know, a couple of times we even had lunch together with families on the weekends. You know, it's, it, it's very much, and it's part of, you know, these people are the, the source of, let's say your success professionally at least traditionally. And so they would, um, so it's very difficult to sort of break free or do something different when this has been proven, right? It's like a religion in a way. It's like, this is proven they, yeah. through their experience. This is the way that works. Um, so for very, I look at it similar. Like I look at any organization, I'll use Tokyo black professionals as an example, is you've got to embed in your organization, new people, you know, that's where to me, diversity is really a powerful thing is that it exposes you to new ways. It gives you confidence to say, okay, you know, it's hard to, to do something you've never seen or to accept something you've never seen. So by just sort of embedding in you around you, people who think a little differently, you know, something, someone you may have something in common, something in common with, so you can have a, a point of departure, but having diverse people around you start to say, Oh, there's a different way of doing that. And I think myself as the foreign guy in the group, though, they wouldn't necessarily embrace everything I embrace, all of my values. That's sort of the, the, I think my, my role was, um, to be that little bit of exposure to say, you know, maybe there's a different way. This may not be for me. Maybe that's a foreign thing, but they would get no exposure had I not been there. So I think for men and for companies, it's really easy when you're looking at a CV to hire someone to say, you know what, I don't think this person will be a match because mm, their language isn't strong enough or they're a woman or they, they, I'm not comfortable with this profile, so to speak, but just to take that risk from time to time. Because even if you fail, even if the person's not a good hire or, or something goes wrong, you've given yourself a little bit of exposure to provide you with opportunities. I think as I get older, I find that the more, the older I get, the more I resist change or, or I want to resist change. And because I have children, lots of them actually, uh, from ages of like 24 to, to 10, I'm forced to deal with difference. I'm forced to deal with this newness, the music, the way they play video games, all this kind of thing. It sort of forces you to say, oh, wait a second, this exposure is kind of good. It's traumatic, <laughs> but it's also very, very good. So for women, I think because, you know, there's less of that peer pressure at the office, to sort of adhere, then, you know, they're going to, you find that they, 
they're a little more open than men are with regards to, to, to finding their passions outside of work. But again, are they really following their own passion? so to speak, you know, are they still creating groups where they create a bubble that, that, that in some way puts up a wall, prevents them from really finding their own sense of full fulfillment or satisfaction? I would say probably because if, you know, of course, if it was, if it, uh, I think probably, but for men, it's, it's, it's really, if you're spending most of your time at work and you need to embed in your work, some mechanism to, to, to expose yourself to new ideas and concepts. And it is not easy. Um, but, and, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people in black professionals are like, Henry, you know, I'm trying to do this. Or I'm trying to do this, start this or do whatever. And I tell them, I said, you know, if you want to be successful, I'll tell you right now, you should say goodbye to who you are now because you won't be the same person at the end of the day. So you've got to be open to redefining yourself. You got to be open to saying, you know what, maybe how I'm thinking is wrong and I've got to try this. You know, it's like green eggs and ham story. I don't know if you know Dr. Seuss story about green eggs and ham. It's one of my favorite books actually. And it's, it's the, the, the lessons ring true. So, um, I think as, um, as men, I think we need to, to spend a little more time doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, change takes time and, and, and improvement takes time and it's never easy. Yes. And it also needs, well, you have to be brave, as you mentioned earlier. You need to be brave That's and have people around you. And I think you need to be surrounded by people who, who, are, who are, you know, sort of supportive of you doing something different or supportive of you being yourself. And that's, I hopefully, I think you felt that way. And people say that when they, you know, I do the same sort of events, like at my home, my wife and I will do a barbecue or something. And we just want people to feel like they're themselves. Because if you feel safe uh, and you feel safe and um, you feel like you don't need to you be yourself, then people keep coming back. You know what I mean? Right. Yes. And so that's, uh, that you feel people yeah. feel comfortable. Yes. I so much like that. Uh, I mean, for me, it's basically co co uh, creating that, uh, space where people can be themselves, as you say, you know, and uh, they, they, they are not judged. They can say what, uh, you know, how they feel, what they want to say. Um, uh, I mean, short of being offensive, of course, to anybody else. Of course. But, uh, yes. But that's really so very important. Uh, that supportive environment and uh, yeah thank you for making the point about that also i have luke and patrick uh here so luke good morning uh good morning maya uh, uh really interesting uh topic uh thanks maya and and, and really great to hear you speak henry um I am an importer of uh, wines and spirits from up in New York State and also Denmark, and, and we're in the process of sort of trying to engage with um, and, and, and build our own community in a way as a business. So it, it's, it's kind of interesting to hear you speak and um, very topical. And um, I'm just really interested to sort of know, uh, rather than the sort of, you know, stereotypical examples, and I'm sorry if you might have touched this earlier in the, the um early in the presentation here, but what are sort of, how do you sort of de define success as a, as a, um, as a group, as a community is, is that interactions or is it headcount or is it, uh, um, yeah. What, what for you, how, how do you define success as, as far as, um, building your community and, and, and how do you see that you've, what you've achieved so far? Right. Um, well, I think for a group, it's, it's, it's returnees people who return, uh, it's returnees as well as recommendations. Like when someone says, you know, someone invited me here or they come back, that's sort of how you measure it uh, for me because what it means is your, your organization is providing some type of value, right? Now, of course, if, for instance, your organization is also trying to build its value for itself, like, for instance, if you have a product, you're trying to sell it or get it out there or, or build it, you know, by people coming and, and, and returning, it means they trust you. It means you can start to sort of engage them on what you're trying to sell or what you're trying to deliver, what your vision is for the organization. Um, but um, the, the returnees means that you're listening to them. Like one of the things that um, – my wife and I, as we organize these, these events, we have to be mindful of is when people come and they're, we have a large number of people, we start to think that, oh, they're coming for us. We can't help it. You know, we think they're coming for us. You know, we're doing something special. We're special. It's in our head, whether we admit it or not. And we have to be mindful of like, wait a second, for the next month or the next couple of months, let's do a survey to see what the people who are here want, right? We need to remember that, you know, people over there in the corner having our conversation has nothing to do with us. You know, they're having a good time here. Let's keep what's working, working. So. Many times, I think if you can get people to come into a, a place where they feel like they're they're getting some type of value, whether it's just a place to relax or it's someone they can talk to or just to share or just to have a good time, 
then you have you, you increase your opportunity to build like trust. You give them a safe place. They trust you. And then if you're selling a product or if you're trying to, even if I pitch an idea uh, for a talk one month that people may not be particularly interested in or may not think they're related to, uh, they may give me the benefit of the doubt. So, you know, what? I'm going to come because every month I'm having this great experience. Let's see what Henry wants to do. And so that's how I measure it. If I was a, a membership organization that asked for fees and things of that nature, it might be the amount of fees people are paying. Um, but right now we're not a, we're not a, you know, a paid organization. And I don't think we ever will be, but, um, uh, that's how I would probably measure it if I was selling a product or people buying the product. But I think eventually if people keep coming, people keep enjoying themselves in your, in your space. You'll be eventually be able to sell whatever you want to to them because they'll at least try because they, they there's a feeling of safety and a feeling of, of, of appreciation for what you've provided. Does that make sense, Luke? Yeah, no, look, that makes sense. And it, it, it gives some good sort of hints for some uh, potential building blocks we might have to, to, to sort of shape. And, and um, yeah, no, look, I appreciate that. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, I think that also interconnectivity is important, uh, if, if I may add, because I, while I was listening to you, Luke, and to you, Henry, now, I was like, maybe because every one of, uh, you know, both of you and every one of us actually wants to, to build a space where the people who ha- find value of being there, uh, you know, they come because uh, they feel probably they learn something or they feel safe or they feel good. But also that interconnectivity is very important because that's how you actually um, uh, reach more people, right? And uh, mm-hmm. while uh, the objectives of uh, every different uh, organization uh, are different of course there are some overlaps there and um, I, I tend to believe that if uh, such organizations you know that have uh, some overlaps if they collaborate or work together to a certain extent probably it will be you know that the synergy effect for all of them will happen at the end of the day so of course uh, it depends you know on the objectives and so on but um, yeah, I, I tend to think that uh, there are synergies there that can be found. Okay, and Patrick? Thanks, Maya. Yeah, Henry, I really appreciated um, your share there. Thanks so much. Um, particularly, you know, feeling this kind of progressive perspective um, on human resources and, you know, kind of stepping outside the comfort zone. Um, so definitely appreciate you being here. I was curious, um, you know, in this neck of the woods, we're seeing um, some awareness of uh, the value of skills-based hiring. Um, and, and this is kind of something where um, they're talking about a wider talent pool, um, looking beyond things like sector experience or um, education. And so I was curious as if to you had any insight or um, any perspective about how something such as education sovereignty might relate to that. Um, that's a term that you know we've seen people use with regards to indigenous populations that maybe have... Um, you know, experience harm from, um, you know, uh, an educational system in the past. But in addition, I think there's a neurodiverse population and, and maybe even an artist community where that might be relevant as well. So I know this is kind of um, a bit random, but just wanted to get your, um, you know, your opinion about those thoughts. Okay. Um, wow. You used some words there. I didn't, I, I'd never heard before. Um, to be honest with you, Patrick. So let me let me make sure I understand your question. Um, your question uh, is with regards to, for instance, you know, skills based hiring. Um, how, you know, my my thoughts on you know how that works, um, how how it's going, so to speak, and also maybe the future of you know hiring based on the fact that people, um, you know, um, you know, have very diverse educational backgrounds, so to speak, and yet because they don't have a particular you know, education, they may be excluded from certain types of jobs. And, you know, how do we, in short, regardless of what industry or what education someone may have had, we're hiring the, the, the best person for the job and it may not be present in their educational history or their CV, et cetera. Is that sort of what you're asking me? I just want to check before I answer. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think you're, okay. you're picking it up for sure. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the question is, uh, I think in human resource, obviously things like you know, AI bias and, and workload. I think it's been, you know, a situation where maybe in recent years, a lot of resumes haven't gotten through because of, you know, um, credentialism, so to speak. And so, you know, how is it possible to balance that need to really get to know client, um, get to know potential candidates with making the workload manageable or just kind of shifting the perspective there? 
Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Now I got your question. And this is a topic I, I, I really wanted to ask question. I wanted to answer actually, Patrick. So thank you. Um, so my career is a product of sort of being, um, you know, the skills that I, I right now, just for full transparency, I'm CHRO for Zyko, but I'm also, um, I'm also CHRO for, uh, another startup and I'm their head of communications because I have experience in marketing and communications, but, um, on a CV, it doesn't show up because I've, I haven't really done a lot of marketing work, maybe for two years at AIG. But um, when I started um, from maybe when I got into HR, I would talk to recruiters and they said, what's your next career? I said, well, I want to work in marketing. Even in the beginning, I want to work in marketing and communications. That's my interest. And they would look at me funny because they're like, well, we couldn't place you in the marketing job. You don't have the experience. And I said, well, I sort of do. I've been running like before Black Professionals Tokyo at Tokyo Cigar Society and other groups, I, I, I market in PR all the time. And if I have a successful group that keeps growing in, 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 in members for 15 or 10 years at that time, maybe six years, I've got marketing skills. I don't know what those are, but I've got them. But it's difficult to sell. Um, so what I right now at, at, at Zyko, um, we had to, um, you know, our head of marketing wasn't working out and we had to let him go. And when people said, who's going to do our marketing? It, it was ironic, but the, the executives, we all agreed, Henry, you lead our marketing. So I'm actually the, the, the CMO as well at, at, at Zyko. And that's because of all the work I had done in the past. So I'm a proponent of saying, you know, it's not about exactly what's on the CV. There's a skill set here in this person that is is there. And we've got to bring it out because when you're interviewing someone, they're interviewing for a particular job and they want to say all the right things. And I sit in every interview. Uh, that we have at Zyko. And it's a lot of time involved. I sit at least 30 minutes in every interview that's that, that's conducted because I want to bring out that out of the person. So um, what I, I think is is missing like when it, from, from, the, from the recruitment process, let's say, in hiring people is people don't write the, 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 they write the KPIs for the jobs they've done, but they don't write the KPIs for their hobbies. Like if I wrote a KPI for Tokyo Black Professionals or, you know, Sasha, my wife, she, she, I'm helping with a program where we teach entrepreneurship to children. If I created KPI saying, you know, created a social group that grew to 1500 people, this many likes per month, et cetera, et cetera. If I wrote my hobbies in that language, it would be very visible. It would show that skill set and capabilities. Um, so I think CVs need, because people are doing so many different things. They have social media skills. They have, you know, there's so much people can do now because of technology, but it's not visible on their CV other than, you know, hobbies, interest. Um, really present what you're doing, what you've done as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a role. It's a job you're doing. You might not be being paid for it, but you're, you, if you don't do a good job, people don't come. You know, if you don't post the right videos, you know, your followers won't increase or you won't have retention, that type of thing. So um, that's first thing, because I think the AI that reads CVs, right? A lot of times when AI is being used, we don't use AI at Zyko. I don't use AI yet because I don't, I don't think it's necessary for me yet, but I can read them pretty quickly. But you need to, to put that in a business context, one. Um, and two, also, you know, one of the things I do when I tell people about HR, when I talk about my job and, you know, they say, I want to be an HR specialist. I said, you know, there's talent in people. And the goal of a leader, I think, in a company, if you want to be successful, that is, is to pull out the talent, the, the, the talent out of someone, get them to give you their talent, right? And if people don't trust you, they're not engaged, they're not going to give you their talent. They're just not going to, to work as hard as you would like them to be, like them to work. So you've got to be able to pull that out. And there's certain techniques in doing that. And I think if more people leverage those techniques, you'll be able to pull a real diverse. And then, then, then that's the, that's the, the guilt goal. Of, that's the benefit of diversity. Diversity isn't about having a room of people who all look different and have different colors. It's about bringing out people who are, um, you know, bringing out those talents and skills that that person's diverse background has, 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 has produced for them. And you need to, 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 to have like a toolkit to pull that out of there. So it's, it's, it's a little complicated. Sorry, the answer isn't simple, but I think it comes to people, you know, updating their CV in a certain way. And also being able to, and people who are recruiting, being able to understand the value, that true value of that diversity and having the right questions to pull that out of someone, not just what's your biggest challenge? What's your biggest failure? There's, there's, there's better questions than that to really pull out the core talent for people. Sorry, looking at time, I'm just going to end there. Hopefully that answered your question, Patrick. Yes, thanks so much, Henry. Appreciate it. Mm. Thanks for that, Henry and Patrick. Yuka, hello. Hi, guys. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. good, morning. good evening to you. Good. good. Hi, Henry. Thank you so much for the interesting insights, um, including the fact that, you know, there is a society called Tokyo Cigar Society. I didn't know that, you know, they had those society in Japan. So I learned something mm -hmm. new. 
another new items anyway besides what you have talked about um my question I, i'm sorry i missed um that how long you've been running this community of yours um mm-hmm. how, when did you build this when you start this Okay, so full transparency. I've been in Japan since '94, so it's been okay. 30 years now. Uh, but the group right. started in 2007. There were three of us: uh, Lady Takara Bullock was her name at the time, uh, okay. myself, and a man named Kevin Johnson. Three of us were sitting at a TGI Fridays, and we said, you know, it would be nice if there was a group um, where we could oh. just meet like-minded people of color, and you know, the people could meet us. And we could talk about business and talk about how to help us help each other build our careers, et cetera. And I shared the idea with um, – he was the president of Shinsei Bank at the time, Terry Porte, who was my senior in college or much older than me. And I shared him the idea with him. He was the president of the Harvard Club at the time. And I said, would you be interested in supporting us? Because he, I knew that we had had um, events at the Shinsei Bank building uh, for the Harvard Club. And he said, you know, you can use the location as much as you want if you want to do events there, you know. And so he was a supporter. So I said, oh, you know, we got we can get support for something like this. That's great. And that's how it started in 2007. But we decided to use more informal locations like TGI Fridays and restaurants for our regular monthly gatherings, maybe using special locations for like gala balls and stuff like that. So it's been okay, uh, 2007. You. So it's been 16 years now. Right. So the reason that I ask you, because, um, you know, the, the first sort of anecdote that you shared with us about your conversation with your host father, um, yes. you know, that's like, a, it hit me hard and hit me home. I'm obviously in the Japanese, you can probably tell by my accent, but I've lived in, in California and Texas, Dallas. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, these two states are vastly, vastly different um, mm-hmm. in many ways. But, you know, but then, I'm, you know, I'm learning the people are different you know, individually, more so than the stereotypes, you know, the dictators. So, you know, for those times that you've been running this community, uh, the the reason, you know, which bring people to your group, mm-hmm. is it changing? I'm hoping that, you know, I mean, the Japanese attitude toward, you know, the people who don't look like Japanese. Yeah. yeah. Are, those attitudes are changing. Positively, that's what I like to yeah, hear. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know about everyone. I, I can only talk about my bubble, but um, uh, I think so. I've been here 30 years. I've seen a lot of things. Um, and I think it is or it, it, it may not be. Who knows? But I do think that um, there's 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 uh, just some benefits in trying. Like, I can't change everybody. But um, And this is the last story I'll tell because of time. And this is why I do Black Professionals Tokyo. In 2000, was it 2002 when the World Cup was in Japan? Uh, about 20 years ago. And my host father, uh, he was a hospitalized. He had pancreatic cancer and he was dying in the hospital. And I went, I had seen him a week before I went to go visit him and, you know, he was, he, he were in the hospital and, uh, you know, he was talking and I come back and the world cup and Japan is playing Turkey, I believe is what it was. No, it was Japan wasn't playing Turkey. They were playing to sort of qualify for the, the top elite eight. Sorry, this story has a purpose. Anyway, I call him. I just decided to call him. I know he's in the hospital, but I call his cell phone. He picks up, he's watching it with the other guys in the hospital. And it's the last time I ever spoke to him because he passed away shortly after that. And he told everyone, Hey everyone, my son's on the phone. My son's on the phone. I remember being in the hospital. He introduced me as his son. So even if most Japanese may think that, um, you know, even if most people don't change, I think it's changeable. Even if it's not, let's say it's not, you know, you can turn someone who was a racist into someone who loves you like a son. That can happen if we try. And that's, that, that's awesome. You know, that's, someone can tell me like Japanese are racist. And I'm just like, but not all of them. And just because they're racist, that mean I'm not supposed to try. And that one person can make an impact on all the other people. You know, I've been invited on boats and things by him and his colleagues who've never met black people because he got to know me. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of benefits of trying, even if it's not popular. I didn't say even Japanese people weren't changing. The six or seven people who do, the six or seven people who are excited about what we do and feel touched by the membership and things of that nature, they're worth it, I think. But uh, overall, I think, yes, I think I've seen things just uh, quantitative, quali- qualitatively and quantitatively where, you know, we've been able to, we meaning as a people of color, been able to work with our allies to shut down, you know, racist TV shows on NHK or commercials or, you know, things like that. Or, you know, I didn't march in the Black Lives Matter march um, and that happened several years ago and, because I'm not much into marches. I don't I'm not a big march guy, though. I, I support him, I guess. But um, but I'm watching and there's thousands of people, regardless of the cause, people are marching together because they care about each other. That's awesome, you know. So um, maybe it'll never get to where everyone loves one another and everyone's okay, but it's 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 it doesn't hurt to to try, so to speak. At least that's how I feel about it.
it's almost like a, you know, like a, a great relation with me. That's a great story to end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Susumu was a cool me, cat. You got me cool. teary eyes. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. I love Susumu. He's a good guy. Story. Yeah. Thank you for sharing yeah. it with us. That's a great story. You're welcome. Yes. Sorry. I think that's time, huh? No, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe you will have to go on forever, right? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> no like, I, I I can listen to you forever, Henry. And uh, your stories oh, are so beautiful. And they may make us not only think, but also uh, be brave, right? Because there is mm-hmm. uh, no pain in trying. You can try. And of course, sometimes uh, things happen, sometimes they don't. But at the end of the day, if you don't try, you know that 50-50 never turns into 100% either way. So... Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing oh, that. You're welcome. So, um, yeah, it's nine o'clock. It's uh, the time when we wrap up and uh, wish everybody a good day and uh, so on. So I, I hope that we can continue the conversation another time and tell us uh, more stories from your experience uh, here in Japan and also back in the United States. So thank, thank you very much indeed. To everybody who stayed with us, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for sharing the room with us. Uh, that's all for today and uh, have a great day. Mm-hmm.